Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Forty-four years ago, I was singing in a group in Bible college, and this was a song that um, our director introduced us to. We learned the song in about two days. It was about a month and a half before we could sing it. Because it's one thing to sing the words, it's one thing to live the words. And are you willing to take and willing to do whatever it takes for your will to break? Is that what you're willing to do in your life? How much do you want the will of God for your life? Let me ask you this morning, do you know the will of God for your life? If I asked you, and, or a pastor walked up to you and say, what's God's will for your life? Do you know what that is? Could you give an answer? Has God revealed his will to you? Now, let me ask you, does God have a plan for your life? How many would agree with me that God has a plan for your life? Okay. If God has a plan for your life, do you think it's important that you know what that plan is? I think it is. Not only do you know what the plan of God is for your life, but how many want to know that plan? Okay. You want to know what God's plan is for your life. Okay. How many want... uh, a vote on God's plan for your life. Yeah. yeah. We say, God, tell me what your plan is, and then I'll decide whether I want to do it. No, that's not the way it works. God's plan, in, the first thing you have to understand about God's plan for your life is, God's plan is the best plan. And God's plan really is the only plan that matters. One of the problems that Christians have is they want to decide whether they'll go along with God's plan. God's plan is a clear plan. It's a plan that every one of us need to embrace. And we need to embrace it before we know it. The problem is, is most people want to know the will of God, but they want to know it conditionally. They want to place conditions on whether they will do what God wants them to do. I'll trade sunshine for rain, heartache for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do. Will you do something and go someplace and be and abandon all those things wherewith you feel secure? For the security of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ wants to become your security in your life. He wants to be that which you depend upon. But most of us want the will of God for our life to be the will of God uh, that we feel comfortable with. And we feel comfortable in our lives when we are in control. But the will of God is not a place where you are in control. It's where God is in control. And you'll not let God be in control of your life until you have surrendered and understand that His will is always the best will for your life. Do you trust Jesus Christ to live and lead your life? Are you willing to let go of the reins of your life and say, God, whatever you want in my life, you can have. I'll abandon everything in this world. Take my houses and lands, my dreams and my plans. I'm giving them all up to you, Lord. Are you willing to let go? Or are you still wanting to take control? One man said, he said, you know, what is the will of God? He says, it's, I'm driving down the highway in my Mercedes Benz. And God says, no, you can't do that. I have to be in control. You say, fine, Lord, we'll, we'll stop and you can drive. 
and, and I'll ride in the passenger seat. No, that's not going to do. He said, well, how about if I get in the back seat? He said, no, that won't do either. He said, because you'll be a backseat driver. He said, well, no, that won't do either. He says, what you got to do is you got to get out of your car, hand the keys to the Lord, go around, open the boot, climb into the boot, shut the lid, and yell through the keyhole, God, you take us wherever you want to go. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to let the Lord take control of your most valuable thing, your life, and lead you wherever he wants to go? That's the will of God. The will of God is that God is in control of your life, and you've taken your hands off. We're looking for an opportunity to do the will of God. We want the will of God. We want to look at it. Are you willing to, whatever, to do whatever it takes to find the will of God for your life this morning? Are you willing to look to Him? Until you decide that your way is not better than His way, you are still in control. Go over with me, if you would, to Numbers chapter 22. The first thing, I'm going to give you four keys for the will of God this morning. I've got four simple words. The first one is to know God. Know no, K N O W. No, not N O. No, <laughs> some people say N O God. The first step is not N O God. It's K N O W God. Okay, you need to know God. There was a prophet in the Old Testament called Balaam, and God said unto Balaam in uh, Numbers twenty two twelve, uh, Thou shalt not go uh, with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. For they are blessed. So Balaam was the prophet, but, and he knew God. In fact, he was the prophet of God. He was the preacher. He was that. But he had a struggle. Balaam had his own will. And while he knew God enough to get a message from God, he struggled with doing the will of God. And he wanted to curse God. The other people wanted him to curse the people of Israel and everything else. But he couldn't do it because God wouldn't let him do it. And uh, folks, it's one thing to know who God is. And if you're here this morning, most of you know who God is. I don't know about your personal relationship. I don't know if you've ever trusted him as your personal Lord and Savior. But most of you know God this morning. And you know who he is. And like Balaam knew who he was, but he was struggling with doing the will of God. And it was contrary to him. Well, first of all, let me clue you in. Your ways are not his ways, and his ways are not your ways. The one thing I can assure you about the will of God, it's probably not what you've got planned. If you're still doing your will for your life, you're probably on a different road than he is. Because God has something much better. If it was the same as yours, it would only be as good as your plan. A lot of people are looking for the will of God, but they think it's going to be bad. But you know what? The will of God, well, the, the road may, and the journey may be different. The fulfillment and the joy and the happiness that comes from the will of God is ultimately what it is. Aren't you looking in your life for something that will give you joy and fulfillment and happiness and a feeling of achievement and success? Well, let me clue you in. That is the will of God. For your life. He's first of all willing not that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The first will of God for your life is that you be saved. If you're not saved, the rest of it doesn't matter. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and called upon Him to save you from your sin, and you're putting all your faith and trust in Him, not in what you can do or your good works or the will of doing the will of God, but you're trusting what Jesus did on the cross. That's the first step. You must first of all trust him. That's the will of God in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. But Balaam knew the, the voice of God. He knew to hear God. Uh, but the, uh, he only wanted his way, though, in the situation. Are you fighting to know God, but do your will? That's kind of like a Balaam act. It, and most Christians are Balaams. They know God. They know God wants them to do something, but they're not quite willing to let go and let God do it. Are you willing to let God take control of your life 
and lead you wherever he wants to lead you. I always find that as I've listened to testimonies over the year, somewhere along the line, you have to let go of what you value. Now, it can be something small, it can be something great. God has taken me through this journey. I'll share a bit of my journey with you this morning. Because God has to take you where he wants you. He has to uh, take you from your plan. And sometimes he takes it from you willingly. Sometimes he takes it by force. Um, I, I, I was studying, God sent me to um, college in Colorado. And there I was studying engineering and um, I, I didn't do real well, frankly. I was more interested in doing other things. And first half of the year, it was kind of skiing and partying. And then I got right with God. And uh, I had been saved, but wasn't walking with God. Never been in a good Bible-believing church. And halfway through the year, I got right with God. And uh, God took, and, some, and this is how God got me right with him. Um, I went to a retreat on a weekend, got invited to a retreat. And God really touched my heart. But every Sunday... I was going with my roommate who was on the ski team and I was snow skiing. And so I wouldn't go to church. Well, that happened on the weekend. I went to this retreat. On Tuesday at ski class, I tore everything from my knee to my, from my ankle to my hip. And so I ended up in plaster for six weeks and everything. Well, I couldn't go skiing, so I started going to church. And when I started going to church, there was this girl there. Danger guys, girls. Okay, so I was there, this girl, and her name was Paula. And uh, six weeks later, I had surgery, and she came to visit me in the hospital. Uh-oh, girls, don't do that. All right, and 45 years later, she's still here. She's still hanging around, see? And, but uh, God, first of all, his will was, first of all, that I shouldn't be studying engineering. So I got attracted to her and not attracted to study, so I didn't do too well, so I had to quit. And then the next year, uh, I went home. I was far away. I asked her to marry me in six weeks. six weeks. Six months later, we got married. I was working a job, and I was making a lot of money. All the things. Okay, how many here want to make a lot of money? Anybody interested? Uh, I was. I was doing really well. I was 19 years old, and I was making enough that in 10 weeks, I could buy a brand new car. That's how much money I was making as a 19-year-old. And then God started inter interfering. Now, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Make a lot of money, right? Most people think, hey, that sounds like the will of God for me. God said, no, I want you to go to Bible school. Now, I didn't know you ended up preaching when you went to Bible school. I just wanted to learn the Bible. I'd gotten saved, got my heart right with the Lord, started doing it. I actually preached a very, very, very bad sermon. It lasted five minutes. It was on Galatians or five, I think it was. I didn't know what I was doing, frankly, and everything. But I stumbled through it and, and embarrassed myself. But anyway, God was good to me. And I was listening to Christian radio, and I was driving down the road one day, working this job, selling frozen food, and making lots of money. And God says, I want you to go to Bible college, and here's where I want you to go in this radio program. I went, whoa. I pulled my vehicle over to the side of the road. We didn't have mobile phones then. I got on a pay phone, called the college, said, send me an application. I'm coming to school there. And it was about from here to Sydney. We got in the car, drove down there, and went to church that Sunday. Why? Because I wanted the will of God in my life. Now, I wasn't real smart. I wasn't real spiritual. But the one thing I was willing to do was whatever God wanted me to do, I was willing to do it. Now, maybe I was so dumb as a 19-year-old, I didn't realize how good I had it and how we were making all this money, because we went to Bible college, and fortunately, Paula knew how to work, and uh, I couldn't get a job. It was really, those times, uh, there weren't a lot of jobs available. First six months, I couldn't even get a job, and I was going to Bible school, and then I finally did get two jobs, and I ended up working and everything. But God sent us there, and God changed my life. And hey, you know what? We, could, we were paying $100 a week rent, and a month rent, and I couldn't hardly afford to pay that. And we'd gone from making, at that time, I was making about $350, $400 a week. And I could buy a brand new car for $3,500.
and that was a Fiat 124. So that was a good car back then. <laughs> you know, he <laughs> say he wouldn't buy a Fiat now, but anyway, that's another story. Okay, so we go on. So we're going there. But the will of God is being willing to do whatever God wants you to do and go wherever God wants you to go. So the first thing you have to find out is that God's will is better than your will, and you need to know God. But not only do you need to know God, you need to know that God's will is always the best will and the only will that you need to know. Balaam, while he knew who God was, he wasn't willing to do what God wanted him to do. Now, if I can find my second point, we'll be in good shape here. Folks, I, somebody says, how do you preach? I said, I find a point and depart from there. That's how I do it. Okay. No, God. Okay, I think I've... Second of all, you need to do is you need to listen to God and to listen to what he has. Um, his word and his way and his wisdom in your life. Uh, let me see. I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going good here. Just not following my notes. Okay. Uh, you need to seek him, uh, and you need to seek the Lord and look for what God has. God always has to know him. Second of all, seek him. Are you looking for God's will? I find some people are always kind of avoiding it. They really don't know what God has, so they're kind of going around the edge trying to find something else, and they're trying to seek it. You know, there was a guy that was avoiding it and not seeking it. His name was Gideon. Uh, Gideon was, uh, I believe, a Benjaminite. He was kind of the runt man, and he was a little guy. He was a fearful guy. He, in fact, he, where was he? he? When God came to him, he came to him and he said uh, some uh, very interesting things. Uh, I think it's in... Judges, I haven't got the book, but verse 11, it says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the, an oak, uh, which was at Orpha, the, that pertaineth unto uh, Joash, the Abazite. And that's good, you're not there, you can't see how I mispronounced that word, okay? And his son, uh, Gideon, threshed wheat by the winepress, uh, to hide from the Midianites. So here he is. He's, it's Judges 6, okay? Uh, here he is. Here's Gideon. He's down by the wine press, which was the low area. He's threshing wheat down there. He's not up on the threshing floor, because see, the threshing floor is usually a high place, because you threw the wheat in the air, and the breeze would blow the chaff away, and the wheat would fall. That's how you did that. Where was he? He was down the bottom at the wine press. Do, by that, doing, doing his job. Why? Because he was hiding from the Midianites. He was fearful. How many fearful of the things? He was fearful. He was hiding down there. He wasn't, he wasn't looking for God. He was looking to stay away from the Midianites. And a lot of you are living your life looking to stay away from trouble. You're trying to hide from trouble. Well, folks, if you stay in your will, you're not going to hide from it. Trouble's going to find you. You need to realize that the will of God is the greatest protection the believer has. It, it doesn't matter whether you're a David down in the valley facing a giant. You're protected. Wherever you go, whether it's the three Hebrew children in the uh, fiery furnace, you're protected. Whether it's da Daniel in a lion's den, you're protected. See, the will of God is the greatest protection you can have in your life, but a lot of people are thinking that they can hide from danger in life, hide from troubles in life. He wasn't hiding. He was there. And then the next verse says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, uh, him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I'm sure he thought he was talking to somebody else because he didn't feel like a mighty man of valor down, in the, down there threshing floor trying to hide from the Midianites. But you know what? God sees in you what you don't see in yourself. And Gideon was there, and he was fighting that. So, you know, it's time you need to seek the Lord, not run from him and not hide. Don't be fearful of the will of God. Somebody asked me this morning, how did you get to Australia? And I shared with them how God got us here. Hey, folks, I was happy. I was content. Uh, we had just rejected another position. We were happy. We'd settled it. This is where God wants us. This is all good. And then God says, go to Australia. What do you mean, God? Things are going pretty good here. We had a nice house. Uh, folks, uh, talk about God providing. Uh, the first two and a half years at this church, we didn't take a salary. I ran a Christian school, taught the Christian school. I had 13 positions in the church. 
We were busy. We were busy. Didn't take a salary. We said, God will take care of us, and he did. He gave us a house. He gave us a brand new car, and uh, we were doing pretty good. And then God says, I want you to give up all that, because I had promised him a few years ago, if he ever gave me a house, I'd give it up for him. He said, yeah. And so God was good. And he sent us to Australia. That's been a pretty good decision, as far as I can see. God's will is more than you are. Uh, almost always, God will lead you in a place that you would never think of going. We do what we know. God does what he knows. Do you think God knows more than you? I, I think so. I think he does. God defeats the enemy with 300 for Gideon. Seek the impossible. You know, the wonderful thing about God is, is he gets you out of your comfort zone. God takes you. One of the things you need to get your kids to do, parents, is you need to teach them to eat things they've never eaten before, to go places where they've never been before, and to uh, experience things that they've never experienced before. Oh, you know, I see so many people, you know, oh, I've never done that before. I've never had that before. I've never gone. You know what? You're, you're content to be in what you know. God wants to get you to a place where you don't know. Why? Because then you can trust him by faith. If all you do is what you know, you're never going to experience what God has for you. You need to stretch your children's boundaries. You need to get them experience. So many people say, well, my kids don't like that. They don't even know what they like. They, I find it funny. You, you, you expose somebody to a new experience. They say, oh, that was really good. I'm going to do that again. Uh, the Wheeze got us to go down to this soup place down in Runcorn. And it, Chinese bunch of stuff, you'd say, ooh. And, and it, it, they pick it all up and put it in the soup bowl. And you eat it. Oh, is it good. You know what? I know some people, oh, I'd never do that. Yeah, you'd never have the experience that we've had. We go down there all the time now. Well, all the time for us. Okay, once a month, two months, or three months. But we go down there. Why? Clear across town. Why? Because it's an it's experience that we've had. But we're willing to adventure. Are you willing to set out an adventure with God and let him lead you? Too many people are not seeking God. They're seeking security. And, oh, they kind of want to live in this little box and hope that the world doesn't get them. Why don't you trust God and step outside of that and let God have his way in your life? John chapter 4 and verse 23, if you'd turn there. It says... But the hour cometh, and now is, that he, they that worship him shall worship him, uh, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Are you willing to seek God with all of your heart and seek him and look to him and say, God, have your way in my life. Know him. Seek him. Thirdly, ask for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let it, then him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. We have a member in our church here that I've heard this one. So uh, uh, Mr. Henry Kim back there, he was telling us on the way back from Newcastle yesterday how God got a hold of his life. I warned him I was going to tell this. He was young. He was being lured by the world. And he was struggling with where his life was headed, and uh, if he should follow the Lord. And so he told the Lord, he said, if, if you want me to follow the Lord and go to Bible school and all this, he says, now I probably got to get some of this wrong, but you'll get the drift anyway. He said, um, you've got to show me. <laughs> well, he says, you've got to show me that by having an accident, how you like this, an accident, and he said, and nothing happened. And so he said, I give you one week, one week to show me by an accident. He gets in a bus six and a half days after he made that commitment. They start heading down the road. The bus, the brakes fail. The bus goes in, has a big accident, a couple people are killed and everything else. I say, now, folks, you don't, 
he, he then knew that God had a plan for his life and what it was. Now, you don't have to go that far. <laughs> you don't have to sit out there and, and get somebody killed so you know the will of God. Uh, you don't have to do that. But folks, God will speak to you and God will show you sometimes. Uh, I was to get to Australia, God worked in our lives and um, uh, we surrendered to stay where we were at. We were content and God opened the door and showed me that this is where he wanted me to go. And then three days, three weeks later, the pastor preached a message and God got a hold of my heart and said, I want you to go to Australia. Now, things were good. I had a new car. I had a home. I had four kids. Uh, we had all this. Everything was going well. I'd had got myself established. I was writing, doing different things, speaking uh, uh, different things. And God says, I want you to go to Australia. Well, what did that mean? I had to give up the new car. I had to give up the house. I had to give up my, where I was, all the work that I'd done for five years and setting all the different things up that I'd set up and established. And I had to abandon all of that and leave. Travel for a year and a half with our family before we came to Australia. And then I had to trust God to get me a visa. They said you couldn't get a visa into Australia at that time. This is 1986. I called up different people. Pastor knows them. Nope, nobody's getting a visa right now. I came down here uh, on a visitor's visa for two weeks. And in two weeks... There was a lady who worked in the immigration department that was in a church in Springwood. She got me an appointment. In three days, I had a visa. Oh, this isn't so hard. Six weeks later, eight weeks later, we arrived with my family into Australia. God makes the way. God provides. When, no one, when man can't do it, God can. So you just need to ask. If any man will ask of God, he give it to all men liberally and not breathe not. You want the will of God? Just ask God for it. Ask God. If you'll seek him with all your heart, James chapter 4 and verse 3, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Folks, a lot of people are asking God for things, but they don't want the will of God. They want their own will. They want God to bail them out of their troubles that they've gotten themselves into because they followed their own will, not his will. See, God will provide wherever you go. God will provide and meet your needs. Because you don't ask for your will, you ask for his will and let him have his way in your life. Then fourthly and finally, and I'll conclude here, okay, accept his plan. Go over to Jonah chapter 1. There was another guy that not only did he know God, did he seek God, did he ask of God, but then God told him. Now, what if God tells you something you don't want to do? Jonah's the classic example. God says, go to Nineveh and preach to those. Folks, you gotta understand, he hated the Ninevites. He hated the Ninevites. Now, Nineveh is Mosul up in Iraq. If you've heard of Mosul there, that's right next to, they found Nineveh. For many years, they said it didn't exist. Then they found it. You know, it's amazing how much light the Bible sheds on science, you know, in archaeology and all this stuff. They found it. It's there. But, you know, the Israelites don't really like the Iraqis now. They didn't like them back then either. His idea that he had a place for uh, those folks that lived up at Nineveh, and it wasn't in heaven. Okay, That's, that was his idea. So he wasn't real excited because God's will was for him to go and preach to these ratbags. And he wasn't excited about that. What if God's will is to do something? You know, usually what I find is, is God puts you in a place that you're not comfortable with. Why? Because he wants to expand your horizons. And he wants you to teach you how much he loves sinners. All right. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Oh, he got the will of God. The, the son of um, Amittai, saying... Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, he said, I don't think it's so great, and cry against it for their wickedness. Yeah, they're a bunch of wicked, they deserve everything they get. Wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down 
into it to go um, with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Whoa, a lot of you are paying the fare and you're going as fast as you can the wrong way. Because God wants you to do something and you say, well, I don't like it. I don't like this. You don't know what good things God has for you. God has some wonderful things. Accepting the will of God is one of the most exciting things you can have. When you get the will of God, do it. Whatever thy hand fighteth to do, do it with all your might. Find it. God has a wonderful plan for your life, and it's a plan that he has to set for you. He's made you exactly for the job he's called you to do. I want you to ask yourself, are you doing the will of God this morning? Jonah is not uh, liked. He, did, he didn't like the Midianites. He, was, he didn't want to change them. He really didn't want to see them saved. He didn't want to go to heaven with them. You know, he, he really didn't like them. So that's why I'm saying you need to get yourself in a position where you're willing to do whatever God wants. That's why I said earlier, get your children to do things that they're not used to doing. They don't like to do. Get them to be adventurous. Why? Because God has a plan for them too. And God wants to use it. Young people, you need to decide that, you know, the will of God isn't what you think it is. It's not for you to be a professional rugby league player. It's not for you to be a uh, a movie star or a singer or something like that. It's not for you to, those things, let the world do those things. God has a plan for your life and you want something exciting, something that will bring joy in your life. It's the will of God. Are you willing to seek it with all your heart this morning? Are you willing to look at, um, you know, you could fail, you could lose, you could do a lot of things. Um, But you cannot miss if you do the will of God. Um, boy, all of a sudden I've got some weird things here. Okay. Lose it all for God's sake. God will want it work in your life. God's will is your best change. Will you surrender to it this morning? Will you surrender to the will of God before you know what the will of God is? You say, I don't know what the will of God is. You know why? Probably because you've never surrendered to do it, whatever it is. A lot of people say, I, I, you know, God's never shown me the will of God. I'd do it if I knew it. No, you wouldn't. That's why you don't know the will of God. God's not going to tell you what it is if you're not willing to do it anyway. You say, you mean, all, I, I've studied and I've done this and I've done that. Yeah. You, you've done all this study. Hey, the last thing I ever expect to do was preach the Bible. Hey, I'm a math and science guy. I am not an English. English was my poorest subject. And to get up in front of people, the last class I took in Bible college before I left was public speaking because I was scared to death to do it. I was scared to death to do it. Hey, like pastor, this is not the thing, you know. Uh, they probably looked at me just like they look at pastor and said, a preacher? Really? You know, it's kind of like, that's not my thing. You know what? God wants to use you, and he will provide the ability. Not your ability, it's his. It's not your training, it's his. God wants you to do this. I want you to ask yourself this morning, Am I willing to do whatever God wants me to do, regardless of what it is? If you're willing to do that, God will open your eyes and show you what he wants you to do. But unless you're willing to do that, you can, you'll live the rest of your life doing your thing. How many want God's will for their life? How many are hungering and thirsting after him? How many want to know God in that real way? Are you willing to seek God with all your heart this morning? Are you willing to look to him? Are you willing to surrender and say, whatever it takes, I'll give up everything so I can have the will of God. Bow your heads. Father, I pray you'd work in hearts this morning. I know that your will is always the best will. 
You're here this morning, you'd say, Brother Carver, I want the will of God for my life, and I'm willing to do whatever God wants me to do. And surrender and yield whatever it is for his greater plan. I don't want to be a Jonah. I don't want to be a Balaam. I don't even want to be a Gideon. I want to be who you want me to be. I want to be in the will of God. You say, Brother Carver, would you pray for me? I want the will of God, and I'm willing to surrender and give up whatever it takes to have the will of God for my life. You raise your hand. Appreciate your honesty. Some of you won't raise your hand. I beg of you, though, to let God have his way in your life. Will you surrender to the will of God for your life this morning? Father, I pray you touch every heart. Move in the midst. Lord, you may call some to preach. You may call some to serve. You may call some to be a missionary. You may call some just to be a faithful servant in your house. But Lord, it doesn't really matter what the job is. The matter is, is your will that they're willing to do whatever you'd have them to do. Lord, let you have your way in our lives and work in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor.